one way or the other? Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, I got it. Great. Okay, so you've seen the title of everything, and now it's my task to, uh, to explain uh, about what instant numbers are and what the results are about. And uh, so th there's a very nice story that started this subject, uh, which is, uh, I hope this goes away in a moment. Well, can you move the mouse down? Oh. Now, if you don't write chat, if you don't read chat, so that doesn't work well. Oh, okay, now. Now, if you expect you have unread chat, so it keeps that tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh my. Well, yeah, so it's, it's just covering the titles of the slides, so don't worry too much about it. The rest is. Uh... <laughs> Could you click on the chat with the four on it and then it shoots? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and now, yeah, now it is. Okay, okay, thank you. And next time, uh, okay, this will keep on happening. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, the start of this whole story. It's, uh, it's an article about uh, uh, mirror symmetry, which is a subject within string theory, which started in 1991 by uh, Philip Candelas and his co workers. Uh, I have to say that uh, the title doesn't mean very much to me. It's uh, basically a, a physics uh, uh, paper, uh, motivated by physical arguments as well, as you can see from the reference. And uh, the, but the point is that uh, this paper contains some uh, remarkable mathematical uh, statements that I would like to draw your attention to. And uh, this paper focuses on one particular example, which I like to... Uh, Okay. Ah, here we go. So it starts like this. Uh, this will be on the purely mathematical part. There will be no physics in it. I'm sorry to disappoint people here for the physics. But anyway, this whole story starts with a, a, a power series expansion and these coefficients. Well, these are a kind of binomial type coefficients, 5 and factorial by the n factorial to the fifth. And these turn out to be all integers. You see the first few of them here. In this power series expansion, and uh, this uh, uh, power series satisfies a fourth order linear differential equation with very simple coefficients. I displayed the differential equation. You don't have to remember it, of course. Uh, the only thing that I expect you to remember is that it's a fourth order differential equation. We will come back in a moment. And what I also like you to remember is that this theta that you see there. It's the derivation that I'll be using. And it's, uh, well, T is my running parameter of the power series and also parameters of families of, uh, of varieties. And the, the derivation will be uh, T times dBT. It's a kind of a log derivative of people call it. And uh, in terms of this theta uh, uh, operator, the, it's the differential operator, which stands in front of the unknown function, uh, it's, it looks like this. It's a, it's a hypergeometric uh, operator for those who know uh, what hypergeometric functions are. Now we're going to, the, Candelas uh, did some remarkable manipulations with this uh, uh, power series and this differential equation. You know that a fourth order linear differential equation has a solution space which is four dimensional, so therefore it suffices to write down four basis elements. And uh, well, the basis um, the y0 you have just seen that's a power series expansion and the other uh, basis elements around the point t is zero um, are not power series anymore you have to uh, enlist the aid of the logarithms so for example uh, the solution y1 which is simply the power series times the log t plus another power series that we call f1 and here i displayed this extra power series f1 it looks a bit like the uh, y0 you saw in the beginning. However, uh, well, you see the same coefficients, uh, binomial coefficients here. However, uh, there's also this uh, thing which contains uh, uh, fractions, basically. And the whole point is that, uh, well, this power series expansion does not have uh, integer coefficients, it has denominators. And those denominators, they keep growing, they get bigger and bigger. Similarly, there's a, uh, there are solutions with a lot squared the t and the log cubed of t. Here I displayed more or less the one with the log squared of t. And so it's the same power series times the log squared of t. The f1 you just saw times log t 
that's a lot of power series F uh, sub two. I'm not going to display this uh, F2, it just gets more complicated. Now, Candela's uh, co workers did something quite remarkable. Namely, they looked at the quotient of the first two solutions. So the one with the log uh, uh, of T uh, divided by the homomorphic uh, the power series solution, so it's this quotient. And then uh, they took the exponential of that. And uh, well, in priori, this is the power series which has in T, which has rational coefficients. See everything uh, here, these coefficients are also rational, uh, taking the X, the X of a power series, again, if with rational coefficients, again, if your power series with rational coefficients. And this uh, Q is called the canonical coordinate. And you may wonder what it is the coordinate of, and I tell you that uh, during this, uh, this talk. Um, so basically, it's, it's a coordinate of families of certain uh, algebraic varieties. So this canonical coordinate has a remarkable um, property, namely a priori. The coefficients should be uh, rational numbers, uh, because y1 uh, clearly has denominators. If you take the x, well, you know that uh, the x has these uh, denominators, these factorials and denominators. So there's very little chance that this will uh, give you something with integer coefficients. But Candelas and his co-workers predicted that these coefficients were going to be integers. And in fact, a few years later, this was proven by Leon and Yao, and they actually showed that this canonical coordinate has integer expansion coefficients, which is a surprise. However, uh, the surprises continue to, to happen. Namely, if we look at the next slide. So if you take this uh, canonical coordinate, this Q, it was a power series in T. Now you can reverse this power series. So in fact, you can now express T in terms of this Q, this canonical coordinate. So T is um, this power series in the canonical coordinate in Q. It has again integer coefficients and thus the, uh, the canonical coordinate has these integer coefficients. And uh, what are we going to do now? is look at ratios of the solutions of the differential equation and divide them by the holomorphic solution. So if you take the holomorphic solution and divide by the holomorphic solution, then of course you get one, which is trivial. If you take the y1, the thing with containing the log of t, and divide that by the power series, well, uh, you get log q. And this is no miracle, because we have just seen on the previous slide that this q is actually the exponential of this. So if you take away the exponential, then you get log over here. So this is uh, rather trivial. Uh, so now we're going to divide the second solution. Can you explain why you're using a new kind of copy? Uh, oh, I see. It's, oh, it's it will be over here. So, so no use of new kind of copy is made yet. Uh, so can I take the third solution, y2 divided by y0, and uh, express that in terms of the canonical coordinate while you get uh, this uh, log q squared and the power series expansion, which does not have integer coefficients, as you see. However, uh, it's, it's, these are rational coefficients. However, uh, if you look carefully, you see that this four is the square of this two, and you see that this nine is the square of the, uh, the three here, and this, it turns out that this continues to hold. So if we get rid of those, uh, we can get rid of those things by applying the operator theta of q, which is the q ddq uh, with respect to q. Now, if you take uh, differentiate with uh, respect to q and multiply by q, q, the only thing that happens is that the two comes down. And if you do it twice, the two comes down twice. And this uh, denominator is eaten up by the, the, the using the operation twice. So what we're going to do now is apply this uh, theta uh, q squared twice to this power series. And the result is, is this. And this is what uh, uh, Candela's and co-workers call it, the Yukawa coupler. And uh, well, the motivation is a physicist uh, motivation. And I guess the name Yukawa is known to you. He's a Japanese theoretical physicist from the 1930s, 40s. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize for his discovery that the strong interaction, nuclear interactions, were caused by the exchange of virtual uh, particles. And so the story is going uh, a little bit that way, if you are a physicist, at least. 
So the, the, the differential is five with respect to Q, then uh, you get something called the power coupling. And the amazing thing is that then, so I multiply by five for reasons that will show up later. And uh, what you get is this power series, which miraculously has integer coefficients. So that is really something to be explained. But it gets even better, namely, increasing the integer of the reasonable bound power. Yes. Uh, absolutely. That, that does it continue to be divisible by five? I think so. Okay. Why did you multiply that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold your horses. Uh. Oh, sorry. So now what you can do is then rewrite this in a software, so called Lambert expansion. So this coefficient, not taking those coefficients, but slightly modified coefficients, uh, which are called K1, K2, K3 in this way. And if these are all integers, the KIs should also be integers. But it gets even better, namely, uh, Candela and Kohler has claimed that if you divide these coefficients, it's visible, uh, it's bottom line, yeah. So here's the bottom line. But uh, these KNs, if you divide them by N cubed, they're still integers, which is um, predicted on the basis of the physical arguments. And uh, these are these, these two coefficients defined by N cubed. These are the instanton numbers, uh, which uh, is already what we're defining. Okay, let me uh, display a few of these instant numbers here. You see that there's a few of them, uh, four that are fast increasing. Up to the fourth one, they're all divisible by five. It's probably, uh, this is the argument, they're all divisible by five. <laughs> and uh, however, uh, there's a very interesting physicist uh, prediction, namely that these AMs, or the ABs, as you are talking now, uh, these numbers count the number of degree D rational curves on the general hypersurface of the P5 and P4, which is uh, quite a big statement. And it follows, it's, it's a physically uh, motivated uh, theory. And basically, uh, instant terms are certain uh, vacuum states, if I understand it correctly. And you can describe uh, bring the surfaces uh, g zero. And if you start counting them, you start counting uh, the curves. So that's a very rough. Uh, Rough way of understanding it, but that, that's this is my best understanding of it. So, anyway, this was the prediction, and it's a, it's basically a physicist uh, theorem. And of course, people uh, wanted to verify this in, uh, mathematically. So, this uh, theorem uh, predicts that on the general quintic hypersurface of P4, there are 2875 spin rates. And indeed, this was shown by uh, Schubert. In 1886, and well, you know that the word the, the term uh, Schubert calculus, which is basically this calculus which uh, occupies itself with counting uh, certain varieties, having certain properties within other uh, varieties, and this is a, a very concrete example of that. Then, uh, about 100 years later, Sheldon Katz showed that uh, the number is correct for the number of quadratic curves. And then uh, I think up to that, those were the only two values that were actually computed mathematically. And multiplied by the paper of Candelas, well, uh, these two people, Ellingsrud and Strummer, uh, decided to verify uh, this uh, prediction for D is three uh, by computing the cubic curves on the general uh, quintic. And uh, well, they did some uh, lots of computations, it was a very complicated problem. And they got some numbers that were different from that. And then they promoted that. They started calculating again. And finally, they ended up with that number. And so that means that uh, they needed some help from this number to get to the actual answer, which led to their exclamation. Well, was they got the correct Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid so, yeah. yeah. When you feel you have to correct that, so that's uh, but the original prediction of the thesis. Uh, how old was it? Sorry, the, the original prediction of the thesis when it made when uh, this prediction this was 1991. So, the Candela's paper, yes, yeah, so it was the Candela's first prediction, yeah. And, and you can compute these numbers at will, you can compute the first 
a few hundred of them that just in your, in your laptop. There's no well, problem. Well, but but if, if, if you want to do it geometrically, then you, you'll have a hard time. So anyway, I think for the for uh, Cotivix found a way of actually computing these numbers and then they also verify it. Okay. Well, of course, the, these were certainly striking, uh, striking statements, and uh, naturally, people were start looking for explanations of uh, all this. And there's a, a field uh, in Belgium called the computational problem of written invariants, which are, are related to uh, counting uh, results on, on varieties. And Dieselfeld uh, really provided the link of this family of this differential equation with the determination of chromic written <coughs> invariance. So we showed that we actually get the so-called chromic written invariance. However, uh, chromic written invariance, if I understand it correctly, they are primary rational numbers, uh, they're not going to be integers or so. So for example, uh, this result still doesn't explain the following conjecture that the incident numbers are actually integers. Uh, this is the conjecture that I like to, uh, to speak about. Why are these numbers, these consistent numbers, so integers? So let me give you a little bit of history of that. Uh, uh, so one of the ideas of proof uh, for this integrality was to work uh, uh, chaotically. Uh, I'm not sure that the geometry uh, uh, audience uh, is talk about chaotic uh, numbers or chaotic analysis. I will not do it too much. I'll just use it now and then. Uh, but there's a beautiful theory by Bork on chaotic cohomology, uh, which does deal with this kind of uh, problem. Uh, there's a message here. Um, uh, well, I'm very happy to say that Yasin's father was the first person I heard that he had been trying to, to do that. And then he got uh, some way in, into, uh, into dealing with things per prime number and the fitting everything together was, was the uh, sort of an obstacle. And uh, later, Mosevich and Schwartz and Paul Lutzky uh, continued this idea and really saw uh, a way how to solve this problem chaotically. And, uh, and maybe I should say, if you want to solve it chaotically, you you look at a, a such an instant number, and then you uh, one. Uh, the question is not directly is it integral or not, but the question is uh, which primes divide the denominator, and you try to decide per prime, and then decide that for many primes, they do not divide the denominator, so these instant numbers are going to be almost integers. That that's the uh, the idea of the, the attack. So. Around well, 2007, uh, Kinchevich and uh, other people, well, they, they really saw how to got a, a framework, how to do this uh, p integrality as it's, uh, as it's called of these instant numbers. However, there's some uh, more, uh, debate over this result. I'm quite sure that they have the right ideas about how to do it, but it's not, not well, it's not written up in a very satisfactory way. So whenever I talk to people and ask them, did they do it? And uh, there's generally, well, they did not do it, but I'm sure they had the idea. But it's not in the not in the literature. So this is a, a kind of an awkward situation where you have uh, things that are supposed to be in the literature that, that, that you cannot uh, well put your hands on. Yes. Yeah. Just a question. Well, uh, so was saying that there are two ways to compute the same thing. You know, it's an equal differential equation, and you have a bunch of hydrogen molecules inside. Right. And then you can ask this to be hydrogen molecules inside. Yeah. Yeah. So in this periodic approach, you, uh, you, uh, you don't really care about the side. You, you concentrate on the differential equation. So this was Dwork's uh, idea of periodic differential equations. So we concentrate on the uh, differential equation, whatever side they are. And then you uh, try to throw in some periodic uh, uh, techniques. Yeah. But did you say the correspondence to the number six or just one of these types of numbers? Uh, you mean the, the different uh, work? Yeah. Uh, I, 
but that's I, I tried reading it, but uh, I mean, for this question, I yeah, but like so for the sense of it's like first form, right? So there's there says the most likely to increase the business like to get it gets the business on average. Or there's a the user equation to get the business on average. Yes, yeah. or work in progress. Right. So now are you just talking about work in progress or is it progression? Is it like two parts? Uh so, so you you uh, let, let's see how how is it going? I think you give it maybe one thing to yeah, yeah. keep the question for the audience because apparently they have no idea what this means. Ah. Like for the audience and for Oh, <laughs> so yeah. This is becoming very accurate. This is, uh, yeah. I'm really out of my depth here, I have to oh, say. Okay, you leave it there. So there was yep. no question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, my expertise is basically on the arithmetic properties of differential equation, and it so happens that uh, you can say something about this problem using this particular kind of technique. I tried to read the Grimmel's Witten papers and the uh, Donaldson Thomas papers and everything, and I'm, I'm really stunned uh, by it. So I have to admit, Martin Cole can probably tell you all about it since he's, uh, he said he couldn't be here. Okay, so, uh, well, so it's an unsatisfactory situation. So uh, this past year, I've been working, well, the past years, I've been working with Masha Blasenko. And one of the results of this work is the uh, following theory that we have, namely that the denominators of the instant numbers can only be divisible by two, three, or five. So no other prime divisors. That's basically it. So it's almost integral, but not quite. But it's, uh, you may not be happy with it, but it's a result that we get. And we were actually very happy to, uh, to, to, to get it because this was an application of kinetic methods that, uh, that are essentially uh, quite elementary. So there are no uh, difficult techniques. Uh, it's elementary, it's just power series expansions and uh, some, some algebra, and that's basically it. Although you can go quite deep with it. So it's still papers, it is a tough read, as they call it. So. So I like to explain uh, about this, but first, uh, so, so th this will be the, the, the subject of what I'm going to tell you. However, first, ah, this is a, a translation of the result. And, okay. Okay, so uh, I have to say that this was only one differential equation. Also motivated by these Pandemus results, uh, some people uh, started looking for fourth order differential equations that would display similar uh, properties. So, Nico uh, uh, van Straten, Nico uh, Dillen, uh, Alquist, and Christian Enkelboort, they, uh, they have a list of hundreds of differential equations that all seem to display this kind of property. And uh, so, the differential equation should have the following properties, namely, I have to focus this. It's a function. I'm not going to say what function is. It should be of mon type, uh, maximal unipoint of monodromy. Uh, well, it roughly means that the coefficients here should should be zero at the, at the origin. Never mind. Uh, we'll get used to it in a moment. Uh, the equation should be self dual. Every linear differential equation has a dual. And then uh, this, should, uh, the dual, this particular type of equation should be the original equation, or at least the equivalent to it. And these are basically analytic uh, requirements. And then there are some arithmetic uh, requirements. They look for a uh, differential equation that would have a, a Wolfic solution whose coefficients are integers or almost integers. Then we, you allow uh, inverse powers of n. So you invert this, this n, you localize there. And then you look for homomorphic solutions uh, with these almost integral uh, coefficients. I have to re uh, remind you that if you write down any uh, differential equation, even if it satisfies those two properties, it almost never happens that there is a homomorphic solution whose coefficients are integers. It's a very rare e event indeed. So this is a, um, you should try it. <laughs> uh, even more, uh, once you have that, then almost automatically, these two properties seem to follow. Namely, that the, the canonical, which you can follow in the same way as we did, uh, should be in there 
and also the instant number should be integers well almost integers up to this uh, nominated of powers of yeah. Of course, I said experimentally because what they did was take this different equation, expand the solutions, uh, compute everything up to so many uh, places, and verify that in the integers. So it's all conjectural, but at least it's a database that you can, uh, you know, you can draw from if you look for examples. Now the interesting thing is here, namely, uh, they call them Calabriano equations, and. Uh, the idea is now, or the conjecture is now, that all these differential equations in the list come from algebraic geometry in the sense that they are become Fuchs equations associated to families, one dimensional families of the Calabria three folds. And uh, well, for many equations in this list, this could be verified. For many other equations, uh, people have not been able to find the family of Calabria three folds that actually yield this Pika Fuchs equation. I will tell you what the Pika-Fuchs equation is uh, in, the, in a moment, or I'll show you how to uh, how it theorizes. Uh, but for the moment, I have to leave it at I guess. Are these earliest or the earliest? It is the list. What well, is it's, 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 it's there? They found a few, or they found all of them in these conditions. So they have a, a, a couple of hundred uh, entries, and all these entries satisfy this property. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of impressive. But well, there may be more. But there may be more, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, well, uh, the, the example that I just showed you that, that must be clear uh, is contained in this. And you can take this big M equal to one. Right? So and I call that the original example, I would call this the quintic example. I refer to this. A couple of times. Okay, now how to uh, go about proving such uh, that this uh, p integrality result for for these uh, instant number numbers? Because for any of those uh, equations, you can find these instant number numbers. Well, uh, refer generally you consider a differential equation of order n, so not only of order four, it also works for order n of non type and uh, non type. Well, it really means that if you look at around the origin, there's only one homomorphic solution, and all the others uh, contain powers of logarithms. Essentially, they can all contain all powers of logarithms uh, up to the uh, n minus first power. And that, that's what uh, non property does for them. And then, if you write down the local monodromy, then the monodromy matrix will be uh, an upper triangle matrix, which, uh, which explains the maximum unipotent monodromy property. So, in general, the, the solutions look like this. And it's quite, don't, don't remember it, just remember that you have powers of logarithms and P. And that there is a Y0, which is homomorphic, and Y1, which contains only one water. That's the most important thing here. So what we can do now is uh, okay. There's a very interesting property that uh, some uh, differential equations have, in particular, Pika-Fuchs equations that come from uh, geometry. And this is called the sort of Frobenius structure. So now we're going to uh, uh, drag in a prime. And we pick a prime p. Let's say it's bigger than five to avoid. Uh, Intricacy is two and three. And a differential equation has a P for being a structure. If there exists an operator like this, and the coefficients, it's an n minus first uh, order operator, the coefficients of power series with the other coefficients. So you can forget about P if you like, if you're not very familiar with the Pianic uh, coefficients, but that's not quite true, but it's Pianic uh, power series. And uh, such that for, if you take an arbitrary solution, replace T by T to the P, then this operator applied to this uh, strange construction reproduces another solution of the original differential equation. So what happens is that if you look at the solutions of this n order differential equation, and then you replace T by T to the P, which is a kind of a Frobenius uh, elomorphism as it's, uh, as it's called, and what this operator was to us, it smears this new thing out in a very uh, 
well, in a very regular way because of these coefficients, to a solution of the equation of the standard equation. And it's uh, the kind of a relation between uh, um, these solutions and these solutions, which are the Frobenius transform of the original solution. And uh, another uh, uh, requirement is that if you take the homomorphic solution, then uh, as a result, you get the original solution uh, back. And this prevents the outbreak from being trivial because the image trivial would also work in this case, but you avoid that basically. Okay, so this is called a Fabinus uh, structure. And uh, we're going to use that in the proof of the uh, of the periodic integrality theorem. So here's the theorem. So even if you forgot about what uh, the Frobenius structure means, uh, it's obvious the theorem can be understood. So if you have a different one have a differential equation with the Frobenius structure, then this middle map that I started with is Q has a power series of T has P integral coefficients. So no P's in the denominators of the coefficients. And this is an automatic consequence of the Frobenius structure. And it's a very simple exercise. Well, it's an exercise. Yeah. You start from this and you work this out and you realize yourself what it means. Then uh, at some point, uh, well, it's the same thing with Y1, sorry. But then you, you, you get it. So it's just uh, manipulations. There's another result. So, if I like to explain, which is uh, about these instant time numbers, how this arises also from the Frobenius structure. But I have to say something more, namely, so here's the Frobenius structure operator that I just showed you. And, uh, well, it's from the last property that y0 should go to y0 again, it follows easily that the uh, constant coefficient of this power series should be equal to one. That's not, not very difficult, so you see it's also you know, trivial operator. Uh, however, um, the constant terms of these power series are turn out to be very difficult to, to compute. Um, actually, they're very hard to, uh, to get by, uh, for example. <laughs> This quintic example it was a conjecture of uh, Candelas and the loss of Stratum, and actually proven by Shapiro that uh, this one at point zero is zero, the A20 is zero, and the A30 is equal to uh, 40 times the other table of three. And now you see that uh, these, these coefficients are really in the ZP of T because you have a periodic number that pops up over here. Okay? Uh, you probably know zeta three is the sum of the inverse cubes of the uh, integers, and uh, there's also a periodic version of that, which is called the periodic table. So very remarkably, uh, this number uh, comes up in this uh, in this which limits which t zero limits of the of the structure operator. I have to say that uh, if you look at uh, the monodromy of these uh, differential equations, if you look for the quintic example, it's quite easy to write down explicit monotonic matrices for this differential equation. And there you also see the occurrence of zero three, which is uh, it's not probably not a coincidence, but uh, it's something that you might be tempted to explain. Okay, so having said this, that these coefficients are hard to compute, uh, Shapiro uh, actually uh, computed them in this, uh, for this particular example. It was a very uh, long computation, very technical. So it's uh, so Bikofen Staten didn't finish reading it. Uh, I tried to reading it. It's, uh, it, it's for, I didn't get to the end, but uh, it got some way. Anyway, now that we have seen this uh, this A one occurring, and now the statement is that uh, we found that. If you have a non time differential equation with a Fabinian structure, as this limit number is equal to zero, then it turns out that these uh, uh, the Kamo coefficients divided by n squared are all p integral numbers. It's a theory, a no general theory involved. It's just uh, the properties of Fabinian structure, uh, which and the uh, some extensions and the unit. Uh, 
uh, um, well, just as a reminder, these KNs, they were defined from this equation that I uh, showed you at the beginning, except I did a multiply by five this time instead. There's even more. Namely, if you have a one times differential equation of order four, with a P for being a structure, and again, this is zero, then these numbers that are called instantial numbers at the beginning are P integrals. And it's also uh, rather, the proof is rather straightforward. Once you know that it's a Frobenius structure and vanishing of that uh, number, then it's, uh, it's not very, very hard. Uh, the hard part lies actually in showing that the equation has a Frobenius structure and the vanishing of this thing. So we're delaying the hard part of, the, of these statements. And there's a, this is the corollary then. And uh, it turns out that this quintic example is essentially, uh, it is a differential equation with a Frobenius structure and the vanishing of this uh, first coefficient. And uh, that we have these uh, isotherm numbers that are started with uh, for p integral for p greater than five. Okay, what I'd like to do now is uh, in this uh, last uh, part, Oh, okay. I'll, 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 yeah, okay. So I, I guess I'll, I'll finish earlier. Okay, so, so let me know. Why would you like to define? Sorry? Why would you like to for PS5, uh, we, we cannot show that there's a Frobenius structure. And for P less than two and three, uh, the, the techniques by which we proved the uh, Frobenius structure are, are getting a bit hairy. So, and as I said, our, our methods are quite elementary. And uh, so we, we like to stick to that uh, without going into the intricacies and maybe we cannot even do this. So, so you're saying the method may still work for PS5, but not PS3. I wouldn't be able to say that. So we have a very naive approach, and maybe it's too naive in some cases. And why is it because of the quintic? It's because of the quintic, yes. And because of the, uh, so the differential equation, it doesn't produce well at P is five. Okay, so let me now explain what a Picard Fuchs equation is. And, uh, and let me do it by way of an example. Uh, so what I'll do here, so first you look at, uh, you consider a family of algebraic varieties, and the family is given by a polynomial one minus t times another Laurent polynomial, and this Laurent polynomial is, is this one, very simple. It's also very symmetric. It has a, it has a symmetry group uh, of uh, S5, uh, this exercise. And uh, t is then the parameter of, uh, of this uh, F, and then you consider a family of, uh, Varieties which is given by the equation f is equal to zero, and the elements of this um, the fibers of this form are then the Calabriol three folds. And let's go to explain Calabriol three folds R and just get you a vague definition of the elements of the so they're basically the analogs of the elliptic curves of the mm -hmm. three surface to the area of the In particular, theoretical physicists are very interested in uh, Calabriol. That's, that's what I know. And uh, so I'm going to construct uh, uh, the realm cohomology in a very, again, in a very naive uh, manner. Anyway, so this uh, F has a certain support that's basically the exponent factors. Uh, those points is called the support. You can take the root of polygon of that, and that's then the root of uh, the complex hull of that, and that will be called the Newton polygon of this F. We denote it by delta, and the interior is denoted by delta uh, circle. And we take a coefficient ring of the module that we're going to define. Basically, we like it to be the polynomials, but sometimes it's necessary to throw in the, the inverse of a, a fixed polynomial, so let's just do uh, that. And then we, go, we consider the R module. Uh, generated by these rational functions. The denominators are simply powers of that F, and the A's are also Laurent polynomials, but the support is strictly inside the support of uh, this uh, denominator. That's what this condition says. 
Okay. So it's a kind of a generalized degree, degree restriction that you have here. So the support of this one is inside, strictly inside the support of this one. And uh, this module is uh, it's called Omega of F with a little circle because of this discrimination. And it's, it's just a normal relationship. Actually, uh, if you want, you can throw in some uh, the axis here in order to make this a differential form. And then you're really seeing that you look at uh, the run homology. But we didn't want to write down the, 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 the x1 that the, the, the x, x1 that you look at all the time. So we just dropped it out and we just worked with rational functions. It uh, works just as well. Then there's something like the exact uh, forms and they basically correspond to the partial derivatives of these, uh, these rational functions. And uh, we also take the partial derivatives with respect to the y, z, and u, and look at the module and, uh, generated by these, uh, by these derivatives and the other derivatives. And we denote it by d omega f. Okay, and uh, now we're going to be interested in this. Uh, so it turns out in, in, in the quotient module, namely uh, these rational functions module the derivatives, you can also say, the differential forms modular the exact forms, which is a typical case of the round homology. In particular, in uh, this quintic example, it turns out that this module is free of rank four. It has four generators, which when it is working its way towards the fourth order differential equation. Uh, okay, well, this is what I said more or less. And uh, the last thing is that these rational functions you can also uh, take the derivative uh, with respect to t, uh, what, which is a, a very naive way of saying that you uh, construct a connection on this uh, family of uh, varieties. You can just differentiate with respect to t using the theta operator. And if you do it for, for example, this rational function, differentiate with respect to t, and this is the result, you get again a function of this form. So this uh, differential derivation operator data, it maps this omega f zero to omega f zero. And furthermore, this theta, of course, the derivation with respect to t commutes with derivations with respect to the other variables, so they commute. So that means that uh, theta also maps the exact forms to itself or the derivatives to itself. And once you have that, uh, you'll see that the theta acts on the quotient uh, module of those two. And it turns out that in the quintic uh, example, the basis of this uh, rank four module is given by one over f and the first three uh, theta derivatives of one over f. So that's the basis of this uh, module. And now the interesting thing is what if I take the fourth derivative of one over f? Well, it lies in the space span by those, so there must be a relation of the fourth derivative of one over f with the lower derivatives, and you can actually compute it, and then you'll find that with this operator applied to one over f, you get a exact form or exact form. And this equation is precisely the Picard Fuchs equation corresponding to the family of varieties uh, f is zero. So now you see more or less how you can uh, get the calculus equations, just the, 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 the connection on the, on the family of, of the cohomology of the varieties and then uh, you can just work it out. And this is how it's, uh, how it's done. Okay, so this was a Picard Fuchs operator. The next thing I should be doing. Okay. Um, I was hesitating whether to, to, to do this or not, uh, but uh, maybe go over it very quickly because now to protect Fuchs equations, you also want a Frobenius structure. So let me just flash you through it uh, and whatever you pick up is okay. So, <laughs> so there's a, a very important ingredient of the paper that we've written is the so-called Parche operator on this uh, on the space of uh, rational functions. 
and it goes like this. There's a kind of baby uh, version. So suppose you have a lower, this is a round polynomial that sort of, you look at such a natural function in the, the module, and you can always expand it uh, as a, in a Laurent series. So to take a suitable point, you can expand, you can expand functions in power series. You can also expand them in Laurent series expansions. And I will not go into the details of that, but let's take this rational function and expand it as a Laurent series expansion. So these k's are the integer vectors that lie within a certain cone uh, of which these Laurent series are, are defined. So I'll write it this way, and I call this Laurent series, I call them uh, formal expansions. And uh, x to the k here, this is in both case, simply means a vector definition for the variables x1 up to xn, and then the exponents of the vectors in the uh, exponent. So this is it. And uh, now we have something called the Cartier operator. It's, in terms of this Laurent expansion, the Cartier operator is a very simple thing. Application, the Cartier operator, CPF, this rational function, is simply given by this series, which almost looks like this one, except that we put the P in front of the K. So that's the Cartier operator. That's all there is to it. Okay, so, uh, however, the question is, if we start with the element of these rational functions and you apply the Cartier operator to it, do we then get, again, a rational function? Uh, this is, of course, the, this is the formal expansions of the rational function. You get, and it turns out that this is not quite true. However, it's almost true, and uh, this is still a statement. Mm -hmm. I call straightforward computation that uh, you might decide for yourself. So it shows that this lies in this particular space. So it lies, you see this omega zero here, that we saw before, so it's almost rational. F sigma is really the original F where we replace T by T to the P. And this half here means we take the periodic completion. So essentially, uh, the image is not necessarily a rational function, but it lies in the space which, uh, which is inside the periodic completion of these rational functions. And these are called analytic elements by Pythagorean. I think this suffices. So they're almost rational functions. This is what I want to say. Turns out that this uh, Cartier operator commutes with all these derivations, the same way that the theta operator did. And so that means that CP maps this cohomology uh, module to another cohomology module because of the final plane. It's equal to this original thing about the X. So we have a nice map of. And now it's also from this uh, definition that I gave, it's very easy to see that the Cartier operator commutes with the uh, T derivation. And if you work this commutation in and out, if you just write it out, then you suddenly see yourself confronted with the Frobenius structure of the differential, of the Picard-Fox equation. So I'm not going to do it here. It's, it's uh, complicated. But that's basically the, the way it works. So the commutation will cause us the Frobenius structure. OK, enough of, uh, about the Frobenius structure. And oh, finally, the last problem to be solved, but I think this takes half the paper of our paper because it's a bit hairy. Uh, the vanishing of this coefficient, which is also necessary, uh, where you can do by looking at another module, which is basically the rational functions that are defined originally, and then you take the second derivatives of the formal expansions. Why? Well, because. In that case, you get certain congruences that you can use in order to show the vanishing of these coefficients. I will not do it here. It's 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 a bit technical, but still, it's uh... okay. So the final upshot is that, as I said, the approach that we take is, is very naive. Also, the models for the families of Kolmogorov varieties is, is very naive. They're just hypersurfaces in toric uh, spaces. And uh, not all the uh, uh, families that you would like to have, you also have complete intersections and other descriptions of these varieties. And this approach does not work for them. So essentially, although elementary, this elementary approach has drawbacks, namely you limit the number of examples that you can explain. Basically, the, these are the extra examples beyond the quintic one that, uh, that we got. 
a finish without this uh, uh, statements. And so this is a result that the incident numbers corresponding to those three examples of P integral for P going to infinity. There are plenty of other uh, examples that still wait for, uh, for this approach, but uh, I think for the moment for us, it's, it's enough. Maybe a small conclusion. There is a, a, a very uh, wide generalization of these instant numbers. And uh, well, this is what my friend told me when we were on the boat trip. So uh, it's, it's a very fresh uh, the results are not so fresh, but the moment we talk to you. So he, he told me about this, uh, uh, more about growing with uh, invariance, also about the fact that uh, there were some people, uh, I'll quote him in a moment, uh, who, who also proved the integrality of something, uh, but he wasn't quite sure whether these were incident numbers. So, of course, I checked. And uh, then it turns out that these uh, incident numbers are basically the zero case of the Hokokoma buffer invariance, as they're called. And or um, BDS state counting numbers. Then it's a transfer from theoretical phys physics. The definition of the BDS numbers is purely physical. Uh, I, I understand that there is no um, proper mathematical definition of these uh, BDS uh, numbers, except for a formula, uh, a recurrence formula, which relates them to the Gromov of Witten uh, invariance. But, um, so it turns out that these numbers are a special case of the BPS numbers for collateral threefolds. And the result that Martin referred me to was a result from 2018, EOL uh, and Parker, which says that these numbers are all integers for all Gs and, and great weight going to the one. So for example, this applies the, um, the, the, the quintic example and any other, I, I guess, well, of course, you have to check all the steps. I'm not qualified to check all the steps. This paper is a 60-page annals paper. Um, the techniques that I use are from symplectic uh, geometry, and I know absolutely nothing about this. So I'm sorry about that. It's all, but um, it's a it's a very uh, beautiful result, I think. And uh, the question uh, arises immediately, well, does this make this whole story of, uh, of what I told you about these uh, periodic methods uh, obsolete? Uh, I'm not sure. So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it does. Yeah. However, I have to say that, of course, many things have to be checked. I mean, there are families of Calabria 3 uh, varieties where these incident numbers are not integers. They have only certain set of primes in their denominators. So yeah, if you want to match with this, you still have quite a bit of work to do to, to get this identification right. So there's a lot of work to be done to explain this integrality of incident numbers of almost integrality by, by this result. But as I said, I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, and the other thing is, well, the, the methods that we have are uh, elementary. So and also, it's a different approach in the sense that you don't really care about the physics or the geometrical background. You just look at differential equations, which may be a nice way of looking at this kind of thing. And in fact, it turns out that here, one final application. If you take this F, which you've seen before, except that there were no Vs in this expression. So we increase the number of variables by one. So this is the quintic example. Uh, Expanded by one variable, V. And now this becomes, if you set this equal to zero, you get a family of four folds. This turned out to be, it turns out to be a family of uh, Calabria four folds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Carfux equation is quite easy to write to, to derive. So it's, it looks like the, the, the quintic one almost. It's also hypergeometric. And uh, from the, the methods that we uh, do, we know. That uh, these you can also again compute the Yukawa uh, coefficients. At the time I expressed these, these numbers are p integral for p greater or equal than two and three. And this is what uh, it says, and it turns out that these uh, Km divided by x squared are the G0 BPS counting numbers for a family of columns of four folds. 
Now, my friend tells you that people are very interested in this form of totals and corresponding GPS numbers, but nothing is known about the um, uh, integrality of them. So, at least there is a useful example to that. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.